Um, so the talk today is on cerebellar contributions to higher function, and I'll be speaking on how that rather controversial topic can be addressed by data from anatomy, evolution in the system, and evidence also from neuroimaging. So as an outline, I'll start by talking about the structure of the corticocerebellar system in non-human primates. So what do we understand about the structure um, in non-human primates? And importantly, why it matters. People often feel uh, that anatomy is extremely tedious. Um, I'm going to try to explain the anatomy of the system in a way that's not tedious. Um, but I do want to underscore that if you want to understand the system, if you don't understand its structure, you'll never be able to understand its, uh, the way it processes information. I'll then touch on evolution in the corticocerebellar system and why it can inform us about the way in which we can extend its role from motor control into the domain of higher cognition. And I'll be touching on a rather elegant idea that connected systems evolve um, as a whole. So it's not different brain areas that evolve in, in an isolated manner. You get uh, concerted evolution occurring in, in a whole system. So areas that are wired up together will evolve similarly because they're all subject to the same selection pressures. So then I'll talk about the human corticocerebellar system and what we know about its structure. And I'll wind up by discussing functional evidence for the automation of rule-related information processing and the role of corticocerebellar system in that. I'll be touching on two issues. Does evidence, uh, does the cerebellar cortex process rule-related information at all? Of course, that touches very directly on the issue of its involvement in cognition. And do the results make sense in terms of corticocerebellar anatomy? So what's the point of studying the cerebellum? Many people have uh, thought of it. Uh, they, in fact, most people who do neuroimaging just ignore it. They never look at the results. And in fact, the, there's, there's a very old template um, uh, a neuroimaging template that just excludes the cerebellum altogether. Um, many people think it's, it's just a, a cushion for the rest of the brain to sit on um, in, in terms of the way that it's structured. So what's so interesting about it, one of the amazing things about it is that it contains between 50 and 80% of the brain's neurons. That's a staggering number. Um, and it really speaks to the vast computational power uh, that, that the structure is capable of. The other thing is that it's highly conserved. So the basic anatomical plan of the cerebellar cortex is exactly the same in, in, in all mammals uh, and certainly the same in, in many, you know, across most species. So it's not changed very much. So by studying its structure and function in humans, it's easier to extrapolate, well, by studying its structure and functions in animal models, it's easier to extrapolate what might be going on in humans. The other remarkable thing about the cerebellum is its cortex. So if you consider the cytoarchitecture of the cerebellar cortex, it's, some people have, like uh, John Eccles have described it, described it as being almost crystalline. So you get these repeating elements, these very simple repeating elements that, um, that, are, that are fairly regularly structured. One of the central features of that is the Purkinje cell, and we'll touch on that later. And you can see here, for example, um, the way that these Purkinje cell bodies are lined up uh, next to each other in the cerebellar cortex. There's a molecular layer, a Purkinje cell layer, and um, a, a granular layer under here, and, and these white matter fibers um, underneath that. So you get this very simple, regular, repeating organization. 
And this makes it very attractive to computational neuroscientists to try to model how this um, a very interesting structure might process information. So one of the themes that will recur is that that concerns the distinction between automatic and controlled processing. So here's a very famous paper from 1977 which made a critical distinction between two modes of information processing. So Schneider and Schifrin propose that there's a form of control processing which is limited capacity, needs attention, is flexible, and automatic processing which is characterized uh, as having no capacity limitations. So they said it has none, it probably has some, but obviously um, those limitations are significantly less than, than what you would get up here. The interesting thing is that automatic processing doesn't require attention, and on the downside, it's very inflexible and very feedforward. Motor learning is a good example of the way in which processing goes from a controlled state that's governed by frontal lobe operations to an automatic state, which many have suggested is governed by uh, cerebellar operations. So there's this transition between controlled and automatic processing. So how does the corticocerebellar system contribute to this process? Well, for this, we need to go back to anatomy. So when the motor cortex wants to control um, some muscles, what it does is to send a motor command down the spinal cord and that results in movement but also its sensory consequences. So the proprioceptive information that comes about as a result of that, the tactile information and of course visual inputs too. So whenever you make a movement it has all of these consequences. For a system that is optimal in that respect, there needs to be in place a mechanism for ensuring that your motor commands that come down from the motor cortex result in the right movements. Another way of putting that is result in the right sensory consequences. Okay? So there's a requirement that we need to um, compare the motor command and generate a prediction. Well, basically, we use the motor command to generate a prediction about its sensory consequences. And this, this system can then compare that with the actual sensory consequences. And as a result of doing that, the system will understand whether or not the way that it's issued this motor command has, has, has uh, resulted in... Um, the movement that it, it expects. Okay? So if there's no mismatch between these two, all is well with the world. Okay? You're making the right predictions, you're making um, the right movements and so on, and it's all fine. Okay? So there's, there needs to be a mapping between commands and consequences. Okay? And these, are, these mappings are learned, it's been suggested, and stored in cerebellum. <coughs> Let's go back to the structure of the motor cortex. Okay, so, sorry, the structure of the corticocerebellar system. So, corticocerebellar loops have a very generic structure. They will all look something like this. So, you have an area of the cortex that sends its projections to the pontine nuclei. The pontine nuclei then send their projections to some part of the cerebellar cortex. And these project back to the motor cortex via the nuclei and the thalamus. So you have this looped structure. Okay. Now how does the anatomy of this system relate to the requirement of this, um, of this theoretical structure? So the way that it works in practice 
is that the motor cortex sends these motor commands down the spinal cord, but it does so through fibres that collateralise. They branch off and they send fibres, they send um, those collaterals off to the pontine nuclei. So, in essence, what happens is that any motor command that comes down the system is tapped off and read by the pontine nuclei. So you have an efference copy of that motor command entering into the cerebellum. So cerebellum processes it, but of course, by this time, the movement's happening and there are essentially consequences being generated. And the cerebellum is now in a position to compare the motor command, generate a prediction about what sensory consequences should ensue from that, and compare them with the actual sensory consequences that arise. Okay? So, we have a mechanism here that's capable of achieving that, uh, that theoretical um, mechanism that, that is involved in, in the optimal control of movement. So the idea is that the cerebellar cortex stores representations of movements that can be used to execute them skillfully and automatically later on. Okay? So, so this process not only allows for optimal <coughs> motor control, online ongoing motor control, but also allows the cerebellar cortex itself to build up a store of motor memories of how things should be done properly in motor control. So th this is a, very, a fairly well accepted idea. There's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with this. People are tinkering at the edges of this. But it's not particularly controversial. But let me put this to you. What if this could be any part of the cerebral cortex? It doesn't have to be the motor cortex. You would then have a mechanism for automating not only motor control, but automating whatever other operations are going on in other parts of the cerebral cortex. So inputs from areas beyond the motor cortex would seem to suggest that this structure may have additional roles in the automation of other kinds of information processing. I'll be coming on to evidence about, uh, about that proposition, that supports that proposition in a while. But before I do, it's worth pointing out uh, that that proposition is not without controversy in the, in the literature. So the cerebellar cortex has always been thought of, as, as I said, as a site of plasticity for motor learning. Okay? Mitch Glickstein has argued that this is, in fact, is its exclusive role, its only concern with motor control. And my view on this is that actually the cerebellar cortex is very widely interconnected with um, other parts of the, of, of the cortex. It's wired up with the prefrontal cortex, for example, that plays very little role in, the, the, in controlling the kinematics and the dynamics of movement. So, does the cerebellar cortex contribute to other kinds of skills? Well, you can boil this down to two kinds of questions. First is which cortical areas actually project to the cerebellar cortex? And a functional question, do these cerebellar areas show signs of plasticity? Do they show these, these signatures of plasticity during the automation not only of motor skills but also of the automation of cognitive processing? So here is some data from the 70s and 80s uh, by Brodal and Glickstein showing us very well that there are, uh, you know, from lesion evidence and degeneration studies and axonal tracing that reveal very dense projections from the motor cortex to the cerebellum. Okay, so the way that they did this is they, they placed lesions in, in the ponds and they looked at the resulting degeneration in the cortex. 
and of course Mitch also injected the ponds, he did the opposite, so he filled the ponds with retrograde label and he looked at which areas of the cortex um, showed that label. And if you look carefully, here's the central sulcus. Brodal's data shows that there's um, a good deal of, of uh, very dense projections coming from precentral. And Mitch shows largely the same sort of patterns here with his uh, tracer studies, but notice that he shows more label in prefrontal areas out here than, than Brodal did. Nevertheless, Mitch's conclusion was that the projections arise mainly from those areas involved in the planning of movement or the corollary discharge from an intended movement. Although there's a modest input from the medial prefrontal cortex, there's very little or none from the lateral prefrontal cortex. I'm going to argue that these conclusions are actually flawed. Okay? Um, if you look at Mitch's paper in 2006, you will see, if you, if you look at a section that's taken from here, through sulcus principalis and prefrontal cortex, you'll see that there's actually quite dense labeling all the way along here, and indeed in the dorsal bank of sulcus principalis. So his own data basically challenges that conclusion. Schmaler and Pandya took a different approach. What they did was to inject traces, anterograde traces this time, into lots of different areas of the cerebral cortex, and they traced projections down to the ponds. And they found, if you look here, these, this purple label, you'll see that there's quite a good deal of it labeling the pontine nuclei. So there's your evidence that dorsal parts of the prefrontal cortex in macaque monkeys uh, projects off to the pontine nuclei. So here's your evidence that at least in macaque monkeys, there may be a role for the cerebellum in processing information from the prefrontal cortex. In particular, they placed injections in areas that are really very, very far removed from motor control. So area 10, which is anterior prefrontal cortex, is about as far away as you can get in the frontal lobe from, um, uh, from a central sulcus. And it sends absolutely no projections whatsoever down the spinal cord. It has absolutely no role in the control of kinematics and dynamics of action. So they placed an injection in area 10, and they found label in the pontine nuclei that you can see very clearly here. So they also found label when they injected area 9, area 946, the dorsal parts of it. Uh, and what this slide really highlights is that all of these areas are really quite far away it's very difficult to argue that their primary role is in the control of movement kinematics. This is just a, an alternative view. Um, if you're interested in going to the paper, you'll see, you'll see the prefrontal projections broken down in some detail like this. But broadly speaking, they found projections from Area 10, Area 9, Area 946, and the, and the uh, homologue of Area 45. But of course, these, uh, there are limitations to these methods. Um, they don't show projections that go all the way to the cerebellum. This is just speaking to issues about uh, projections between the, from the, the cerebral cortex to the pons. What about the projections that go onwards to the cerebellar cortex? Of course, most people in this field will know that anything that arrives in the ponds has a 99% chance of ending up in the cell okay. Kelly and Strick did a clever study in which they used uh, viral traces. Now, the nice thing about viral traces is that they can jump synapses. So you inject into uh, one neuron. It doesn't 
simply travel down to the end of that neuron and stop, it, it jumps synapses and then labels the next neurons along. So in doing so, this is a method that's allowed Kelly and Strick uh, to label um, the areas of the cerebellar cortex that are wired up to the motor cortex and to area 46 in prefrontal. And what we find is that those projections from Purkinje cells that go in the cerebellum that go back to M1 and M1 that go, uh, neurons that go back to uh, uh, the cerebellar cortex are restricted to particular lobules. So the motor lobules in the cerebellum include uh, lobules 4 through to 6, a um, little bit also in 7B and also in 8 in H8. The other thing that you'll notice is that it confirms the idea that it's organized in the loop. So the areas that go from Purkinje cells to M1, broadly speaking, um, are the same lobules which actually project out to M1 as well. Okay, so it, there's, there's a looped organization here. Now, the interesting data comes from injections of Area 46. So they injected one virus that traveled retrogradely in another, in another set of animals that traveled anterogradely, and what they found was that it was areas CRUS-1 and CRUS-2 that predominantly, um, these are the areas uh, that are basically talking to uh, area 46 in prefrontal cortex. So there's a lobular segregation of inputs and outputs. So if you're looking in the human brain and you find some activity there from an fMRI study, you want to know how to interpret it, you can refer back to data like this. And you can say, well, if it's in CRUS1 or CRUS2, we know which parts of the cortex these areas are talking to. So the bottom line is that Kelly and Strick have nicely mapped the connectional anatomy in uh, Primex. And it's organized in, in a looped fashion where some lobules, these blue lobules here, project off to the motor cortex, and these green ones here are wired up to the prefrontal cortex. So let's go back to this idea of concerted evolution. We know that the frontal lobe, uh, the prefrontal cortex in particular, has massively expanded during the course of evolution. That's an idea that some people think is a little bit controversial still, but I think most people buy it. If selection pressures apply not to single brain areas, but whole functional systems, then you would expect similar uh, patterns of evolution going on in the cerebellum. You would expect that these green lobules here would expand in line with the expansions that we see in prefrontal cortex. So that's an interesting hypothesis to test. And it can be tested so here's a, here's a brief summary of the prefrontal loop and the motor loop. Okay, so here are the particular lobules that the prefrontal cortex is connected to and the ones that the motor cortex is connected to. We can test it at the level of the cerebellar output nuclei. Okay. We can also test it at the level of the prefrontal cortex itself, which has been done now. But in general, you'd, print, you'd predict an expansion in these structures in the ventral part of the dentate, which is the, the bit that is talking to the prefrontal, and you would expect much less of an expansion or perhaps even no relative expansion in this loop here. Okay? We've looked at this problem from the perspective of the cerebral peduncle, and the cerebellar cortex itself. So we've looked for these expansions in those particular areas. So we've looked at this set of fiber pathways using DTI and uh, volumetry using 
uh, in the cerebellar cortex. So here's a little schematic of the dentate nucleus and the macaque. You can see that the dorsal part is larger than the ventral part. Uh, there are some arguments about where the subdivision should be. But on the whole, I think there's a general agreement that the dorsal dentate uh, and the ventral dentate, uh, there's, no, there's no great expansion in the ventral dentate. If you look at the human dentate, you'll see that the ventral component is very, very significantly larger than the dorsal component. So the bottom line is that we see some evidence from the work of Matano and colleagues that there's been this big expansion in the human brain um, in, in that prefrontal loop. Yeah, and then yeah. The and the That's correct. Yes, and there's some controversy about that. You know, um, there's there are some issues about whether that subdivision is an arbitrary one or not, um, and I I think that probably needs to be addressed some, you know, further. But well, that was well, that was the criteria you said. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What about the inputs from prefrontal cortex into the pons? Have those expanded now? Um, we've addressed this issue using uh, diffusion imaging. If you look at Gray's anatomy, you'll see that the um, cerebral peduncle through which these fibers pass is kind of coded in the following way. There's this thing that is, it used to be called the prefrontopontine tract, the, the the, uh, another tract adjacent to it containing motor fibers and then temporopontine fibers back here. Um, this is conventional wisdom, but nobody really knows whether it's right. Okay, It's in the textbook. Everyone's gone along with it. And frankly speaking, I've looked, I've tried to find some evidence for this, uh, this sort of organization. And actually, there's nothing out there in the literature. I think they just drew an arbitrary line here and here based on their assumptions. I really do think that. Um, and it shows you that the motor fibers, you know, it occupies this enormous chunk of, of the cerebral peduncle. I don't know what the evidence is for that. So we try... Sorry? They should read... I found it in 1895. Yes, yes. It went not that... It's close to that. Yes. Yes. Well, Desjardins was a ropey study. He's had some heavy ropey data and some ropey conclusions. But anyway, let's move on. Um, so, as many of you will know, it's possible to use DTI to try and investigate this issue. How do the fibers really distribute in the cerebral peduncle? So we use DTI to track fibers from many parts of the cerebral cortex down through the pons and use, that, use those patterns to segment the cerebral peduncle into, um, into different parts based on where those fibers are coming from. Okay. Now, if you're... Looking at subjects related to evolution, you've got to do this in a comparative sense. And um, we decided that we would also do the same thing in macaque monkeys. Okay. So here are the results. This is how we, broadly speaking, segmented up the cortex into various cortical zones. Um, these two represent cases from the cerebral cortex of, uh, sorry, represent human cases, these two macaque, and you can see that this big green area here, prefrontal cortex, is, um, occupies quite a large volume of prefrontal cortex of the cerebral, of the cerebral peduncle. In, in comparison, that volume is much lower in monkeys. And in fact, if you look at the data as a whole, you'll see that about a third of the human cerebral pedun peduncle is occupied by fibers from prefrontal cortex. And about half of that proportion 
um, is occupied by prefrontal monkeys. So here's some evidence that this system, again, has expanded up during the course of evolution. So I'd be happy to, by the way, to, to talk to you about bits and pieces of all of this work a bit later, but I'm, at the moment I'm just going to steam through and, and show you whatever data I can. What about the same question applied to the cerebellar cortex? So my PhD student, uh, Josh Bolsters, uh, conducted a very, very, very tedious, painstaking study for which he has not thanked me um, in the least. Um, I should say that he started off being very willing to do it. Um, but he, he basically manually segmented the cerebellar cortex from several capuchin monkeys, several chimpanzees, and several humans. And the idea was to test whether the lobules that were receiving projections and sending projections to the prefrontal cortex have disproportionately expanded compared with the lobules that are talking to the motor system. Okay, so what did he find? Okay, so this is just some, uh, some information about how, how we got this data. We used MRI scans from humans. Chimpanzees are from uh, Emory University, from Jim Rilling and colleagues, and caption monkeys from Kimberly Phillips. So this is a sample of Josh's very considerable efforts. Uh, you can see that, that Cruise 1 here and Cruise 2 are the two lobules that receive from prefrontal. In the human brain, you see that, um, you know, sorry, this is capuchin. In human, you can see that it occupies a really a very considerable proportion of the cerebellar cortex, and much less so in capuchin monkey and chimpanzees like somewhere in between. If you want to quantify this, these are the results. For Cruz 1, there was a very, very big difference uh, between humans and chimps. Humans and chimps are really separated by only 5 million years of evolution. There are you know, I think at least 40 million years of evolution that separate us from capuchins. So you can see that uh, Cruz 1 and Cruz 2 really, really dominate this difference. Okay, so here's some evidence showing that the lobules of the cerebellar cortex that are talking to the prefrontal cortex have disproportionately expanded. Okay? Well, it's all very well to talk about anatomy what about the way that these areas talk to each other in the human brain? Is the wiring likely to be the same or not? So Jill O'Reilly did a study with us where she put people into the scanner. Have you, are you familiar with resting states? Is there anyone who's not familiar with resting states here? Okay, so I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that anyway. So we put people into the scanner and they do absolutely nothing, they just lie there. And we collect baseline resting data from them. Areas that are connected up to each other should influence each other. Okay, so you should see physiological correlates between these between connected areas. So what Jill did was to isolate the voxels in the motor cortex and ask the question. Um, in that motor cortex time series, how much of that signal can I predict from signal? Uh, where, where in the cerebellar cortex is the signal predictable um, on the basis of the signal coming out from the motor cortex? Okay. This is another way of asking an anatomical question. Of course, in humans, you can't, uh, you can't put horrible viral traces into, into your volunteers. So the next best way of doing this is, is, to, is, to map, is to try and achieve these mappings physiologically. And what she found was that it was the same lobules around here that Peter Strick found in his, um, 
uh, anatomical study in the cats. And what about prefrontal cortex? So she did exactly the same thing. She took all the voxels in the prefrontal cortex and asked the question, where in the cerebellar cortex can you predict the activity in prefrontal based on the activity in those voxels? And she found activity, again, in Cruise 1 and Cruise 2 of the human cerebellar cortex. So this is very nice correspondence between what Peter Strick showed anatomically in the human brain, in the macaque brain, and what might well be going on in the human brain. There's a correspondence between, uh, between the two species using these different methods. Let's touch a little bit on cerebellar learning. So we go back to this issue and try to understand what Cruz 1 and Cruz 2, what kind of processing might be going on there. So back in 1969, David Marr published a very, very influential paper. And it was then followed up by James Albus. Um, these two papers have really completely transformed our understanding. Um, they, they, they lay the theoretical groundwork uh, with which we now study the cerebellum. And that groundwork has not changed very much since then. These, I can't underestimate, uh, I, can't, I can't understate how important these papers are. So um, they constructed models of motor learning that went something like this. So whenever you form a motor memory, how is it done? Where are those changes encoded? They proposed that it's encoded in the synapses, these Hebbian synapses that change between parallel fibers and the principal computational unit of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cell. So you get these very interesting uh, uh, neurons, Purkinje cells, that form the main outputs of the cerebellar cortex. And the weights of these, these synapses are adjusted as motor learning proceeds. And that's how motor learning, motor memory, is laid down in the tissue of the cerebellar cortex. Whereas Ma suggested that this should be synaptic facilitation, a bit like LTP, something that you're all familiar with, no doubt, Albus said synaptic strengths will actually tend to zero asymptotically as incorrect synapses tuned out, much like LTD. Okay? So they both predicted the opposite mechanisms, in a sense. Albus's prediction would be that the excitability of Purkinje cells would start to decrease as motor learning proceeded. My proposal is that there are common cerebellar cortical mechanisms of plasticity that support not only motor learning in the motor loop, but also the automation of rule-related learning in the prefrontal loop. Okay? So the very same mechanisms that are engaged during motor learning are also engaged during the automation <coughs> of cognitive behavior. And this basically um, has been the focus of the work that's been going on in my lab for the last a few years. We've been testing hypotheses such as, do these areas process symbolic rule-related information at all? So, you know, if they don't even respond to, um, you know, to stimuli that um, uh, provoke subjects to exercise rules and so on, then, of course, there's no question that we shouldn't take this any further. So we've been testing whether, whether the cerebellar cortex is responding when subjects are uh, placed under conditions where they're required to execute rules. Do these areas show signatures of plasticity, such as those um, identified by James Albus during the automation of rule-based learning? And finally, does the cerebellar activity reflect the long-term effects of error on plasticity rather than the occurrence of the errors themselves? So we, we've been trying to dissociate signal related to processing of errors from signal related uh, to the long-term changes that they cause 
And if there's time, and I, I realise I'm already running out of time here, how do prefrontal cerebellar interactions change as rule learning proceeds? Okay, so we used the first thing I'm going to do is to talk about an fMRI study in which we look at the learning of a first order rule. Okay, so conditional motor learning has been held up in the past as a task that is fundamentally cognitive. It's a task that is not one of motor skill but of acquiring knowledge. And the nice thing about conditional learning is that it allows us to impose very stringent control over, uh, over decision-making processes. So here's how it works. The monkey or the human looks at a completely arbitrary cue. Okay? So this just pops up in front of them. There's a variable time delay, and I'll make clear later why that's important. There's a go cue, and they're required to execute a motor response. And there is a pairing between this instruction and a particular response, and you have to learn that pairing through trial and error. So at the end of, end of that process, they get an outcome telling them whether they picked the right response given this instruction cue. Okay. And by doing so, they learn various mappings between different cues and different responses. It's really quite simple. So here's another experiment by Josh where he looked at, um, he presented two types of cues. One was completely arbitrary, purely symbolic, nothing in there that would tell the subject which response to make. And as in the previous example, it's informative, so they had to go off and they had to pair it with a motor response. The other was a control trial, it was non-informative, and I'll come on to how that was non-informative in a moment. And then there was a direct response here where we presented this stimulus, uh, that's Josh's hand with a finger highlighted, instructing the subject very directly which finger to press. How embarrassing. Let's leave that there. Um, so here's the control trial where no finger was highlighted. And so there was a, we varied the occurrence of this over this instructed delay period. Later on, we gave them a response period a few seconds later, where they were given a go symbol, a response period, and a tick or a cross. Note that these cues here were arbitrary and these were direct. Okay? So what we're looking for is a cerebellar signal that's time-locked to this. And that's the essence of this design. By varying these, um, these, these, these cues in time, we are able to disambiguate the hemodynamic responses that are time-locked to the instruction cues from the responses that are time-locked to the response. So any response that you see has got nothing to do with the control of movement. It's only to do with the, uh, the way in which these instructions are processed. So if we're right, and the cerebellar cortex, cruise one and cruise two, are interested in the business of processing very symbolic, high-level cognitive information, we should see something time-locked to this in those areas. So I'll skip over the, uh, the methods and the behavioral results for the sake of time and show you the, the uh, results. So we looked at an interaction between arbitrary and direct cues and informative and non-informative cues. So we, we looked at these two here and look for the differences between them and what we found is that the symbolic informative cue showed uh, a response that was disproportionately higher than all of the others. Okay, so here's some evidence that in cruise 1 and cruise 2 you can see uh, a response there that is basically time locked to a, to a symbolic cue that is informative. 
So here's some evidence um, that the cerebellar cortex is interested in this kind of information. But what about Albus's idea that the cerebellar cortex should show signs of plasticity when you learn these mappings? Okay. So does, do these areas play important roles in the automation of processing? And one issue about automatic processing um, is it, it's very easy to test if you employ dual task. Okay? Dual task methods allow you to, to uh, in a very pure way, test whether performance is robust to the effects of distractors. So one hypothesis is that increasing automation of cognitive control will result in learning related changes in CRUS1 and CRUS2. So we're looking for that signature of plasticity that James Albus was talking about before. Okay. And the other thing is that we made sure that um, we used uh, dual task to see whether they really were um, automatic behaviors. So here's the summary of the design. This is slightly complex, but before we put these people into the scanner, we trained them on exactly the same task that I've shown you before, but we used, for one set of cues, we used 100% reinforcement. On another set, we used 50% reinforcement, so they learned these cues at different rates in the same session. We then put them into the scanner, and we carried on training them. So in this phase, they knew what the cues were, but they went on becoming automatic. And the reason that we did that, the reason that we employed this design, is that we realized in some of our piloting work that faster learning here leads to faster automation in the subsequent phase. And the evidence of that is dual task, where we found in our pilots that dual task before resulted in reaction times like this, dual task after resulted in a differential emerging at, at the end of that prolonged phase of training. So here's a nice way to dissociate um, and to look at two types of cue, one becoming increasingly automatic while the other is progressing at a much slower rate. So I'll skip over the methods again. And what we found is, so we looked for an interaction between condition, less practice and more practice, and time, overtraining. So as automation proceeded, uh, so here are the behavioral results. These blue cues became automatic much more quickly than these red cues. And you can see that that's reflected in the cerebellar signal, where the, the signal time lock to the blue cues was faster than that in the red. Okay. So here's some evidence that if automaticity progresses more quickly, you get a faster signature. You get, an, you, you get a corresponding signature of plasticity in cruise 1, cruise 2 of the cerebellar cortex. Okay. What about more complex forms of learning that have been employed more commonly, as such as sequence learning? So here you can see a paper by Shima in 2007 where Shima and colleagues recorded from prefrontal cortex in the upper bank of sulcus principalis where those neurons are projecting from to the cerebellum. And you can see that the responses of these neurons couldn't care less about the actual movement that these monkeys were performing. It's much more interested in coding the sequence as a whole. So if the monkey was instructed, turn, turn, push, push, it was, these neurons were specific to that. They were not specific to other sequences or in the individual movements. Okay. But what happens when this kind of behavior becomes automatic? So it's a problem of learning both motor skill and cognitive skill. So you would think, wouldn't you, that both of these loops are going to become engaged. So we tested this hypothesis 
by presenting two conditions to subjects. We alternated sequence and random blocks, so they were just performing visually cued motor sequences. Um, it was a very, very simple sequence, and most of the variants that you see in the fMRI signal would be related to increasing proficiency in its execution rather than the learning of the sequence itself. The learning of the sequence, it was just a simple four-digit sequence, that was over and done within the first block. After that, it was just the business of becoming automatic. So much to our surprise, we found that the same signature of plasticity was present not in the motor system, not in a motor loop, but in these parts of the cerebellum that are projecting off to the prefrontal cortex. I should say also that we found corresponding changes in area 10 in anterior prefrontal cortex as well. So here's the signal in, in, in this area. It went, it went down, largely speaking. I wouldn't worry too much about this thing. This is just uh, because of the way that we modeled using polynomial functions. In, and this is in the sequence condition. In the random condition, it, it didn't change uh, very much at all. So you see a nice signature of plasticity there that James Albers would predict um, an exponential decay in the signal. Okay? So it's quite surprising that we see nothing going on in the motor system. And we realize some way down the line uh, that actually there were papers starting to come out suggesting that any changes that you would see in the motor lobules and in the primary motor cortex would be taking place over a series of days rather than um, uh, rather than the very short time scales that we're seeing here. So there's some evidence that they are learning the rule, uh, that the, the mechanisms for actually learning the rule related to the sequence and its automation are sitting in area cruise 2. But another element of the hypothesis that Marr, Brindley, and Albus um, proposed, and one that's been neglected, is not just how the cerebellar cortex learns, but how is it that the motor cortex can access those representations? How is it that a command from the motor cortex can trigger the cerebellar cortex to start executing that learned behavior. So you get relatively high-level commands from, uh, from um, areas of the cortex that access the cerebellar cortex so that when, in Ma's own words, when we, have been, when we have learned a simple or incomplete message uh, from the cerebellum will suffice to provoke their execution. So a very simple command from the cere cerebrum will provoke the execution of that. So our prediction was that if we go back to the very same data set, we should see a change in the connectivity between the motor, between not the motor cortex in this instance, but the prefrontal cortex, a change in the connectivity of the prefrontal cortex and the cerebellar cortex. Um, and that should change as a function of time. So there are some statistical methods in imaging, such as dynamic causal modeling, that can allow you to do this. So we specified an anatomical model where the left prefrontal and the right pref and the right cruise two were talking to each other, and likewise on the other side because our activations were bilateral, and we thought we ought to also test this in uh, in the motor system as well. Okay, and what we found is that there was no change. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over that, actually, because of time. Okay, so our results basically said that we found time-dependent changes in these connections, okay, and they were all time-dependent increases, in such that the prefrontal cortex was increasingly sending a signal down to the cerebellum to 
uh, as, as learning was progressing. Again, we didn't find any such change going on in the motor system, which we also find very odd. So in the final experiment that I'll talk about, I'll talk about um, very briefly about error processing. So we take exactly the same task. Subjects are executing a visually paced sequence. Sometimes that pacing cue would change. There would be an unexpected change. So the pacing cue would indicate a different key press rather than the one that was expected. We weren't so interested in what happens when this occurs. What we were more interested in is what happens immediately afterwards. So when you destabilize this model, how does it then start responding after that? So we compared what was happening before the error with what happened after the error in our MRI signal. And what we found was um, that there was a difference. There was a big increase in the signal in cruise one of cerebral cortex. Okay? So the post-error signal was much higher than the pre-error signal. And bear in mind that there is no error taking place in these trials that we're comparing. It's only uh, the context of the previous block. Okay. So it's as if we're shifting, the, we're shifting the state of the cerebellum back to an earlier phase of learning when the signal ought to be high, according to James Alpers. So there's another study that highlights the important role that this plays when these rules, these highly trained rules, are violated. Cerebellum is sent back to a previous state where things are maybe a little less certain. So, um, in the interest of time, I'll skip over the last study and con the conclusions. So, we've shown some evidence for concerted evolution in this system through anatomical studies. We've shown that there may be a common mechanism of plasticity for the automation of motor and cognitive processing. And we've also shown that the connectivity within the prefrontal loop changes specifically in relation to rule-related task demands. Um, and with that, I'll end by thanking uh, uh, the people in the lab um, and also the collaborators with whom I've been very fortunate to work and the funders who've made this, these studies possible. Many thanks. <laughs>